Hey everyone, today's April 10th, 2017. This is Human Factors Cast, episode 36. After two weeks of slow news, I don't know how we're possibly going to fit everything that happened this week into the show. We'll talk about driverless vehicles, cover some much-needed good science community news. Uh, we'll talk about some of that medical Human Factors news this week and much more. Don't forget to tag us with spicy and authentic because Human Factors Cast starts right now. to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Good afternoon, everybody, on this wonderful Monday. How are you, Nick? I'm good. I'm good. Blake, how are you, buddy? Oh, I'm loving it. Loving it? Do you, uh, how, how, how are you doing this week? Uh, this week is pretty good. I mean, back in California, using the stand-up desk, I'm, I'm excited for this episode. Oh, I'm so excited for this episode, too. Um, so let me, let me tell a story really quick, because before we get into the news, we always like to, you know, in, introduce a little brief banter. Let me tell you about my story of the week. So, I, oh, well, I guess it's of the day, and it's, it's pertinent to what we're talking about, so... Today, I was working on a project, right? And and as you do in uh, the user experience or human factors field, you provide uh, an avenue for the user to recover from errors, right, Blake? This is one of the heuristics for the usability heuristics that everybody Super knows. big deal, yeah. Yeah. So there I was editing this um, thing. I'll, I'll be ambiguous about it. I was editing this thing because I don't want to call them out on the air because it's like tacky. But I was editing this thing, right? And I went to go delete a thing on this thing. And I was like, yes, go ahead and delete it. It's fine. And I can't get it back. And this was probably like hours worth of work, of somebody else's work, mind you, that I just deleted. So, Oh, no. <laughs> so I have no way of getting that back other than having that poor person do all that work again. But I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to name companies. I'm just frustrated because of poor user experience. Blake, did you have any experience with poor uh recovering from errors or just bad ux this week i did experience a bad ux thing this week i won't name the actual video game but it's a first person shooter that i'm stoked that's coming out and they're throwing out a beta test and actually through instagram is how i found it and the the whole thing was it's an instagram advertisement and you click it and it's supposed to take you to where you would you know give your information so you can be put in the lottery for the actual beta well, whatever page it actually takes you to, there's no sign up anywhere on that page and there's no way to what? actually get all your credentials in. So it's it's one of those things where I had to like dig through the rest of the website going to subsequent pages after getting away from the advertisement uh, before I could finally find it. So that was a that was a tough one. Man, they they really hide all those things well. Well, I, I you know what though, dude? I want to hear from our listeners like if they have any bad UX stories. Uh, feel free to call out those companies. We may or may not call them out on the show. Um, but if you guys have any interesting bad UX stories or any sort of uh, good UX, like good user experience, good human factors, just throw it our way. We'd love to read that stuff. And uh, maybe if it's good enough, we'll read it on the show. We do read everything that you guys send us. Just <laughs> just so you guys know, we do read everything. We read literally every single thing that comes through our inbox and through our Facebook messages and Twitter DMs. We read everything, but we don't always put them on the show because sometimes it's not appropriate. Uh, but thank you for writing in nonetheless. And if it is appropriate, we'll read it on the show. <laughs> but, <laughs> but let's go ahead and move on to Human Factors News. And this is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. We got a lot this week, man. We got a ton of stuff this week. This could be anything from artificial intelligence, virtual reality, automation, medical, transportation, psychology, design, whatever it is. I know that was a mouthful. You name it. That was a mouthful. As, wow. <laughs> As long as it, this used to be a family show, as long as it has to do with the field of human factors. Blake, what do we got up first today? All right. So up first, we're in the automotive industry. So Daimler and is one of the largest vehicle manufacturers in the world, and it announced that it's partnering with Bosch, one of the largest automotive tech and hardware suppliers in the world, to bring fully autonomous vehicles to urban roads by the start of the next decade. 
They plan on co-developing vehicles capable of level four fully automated driving and level five driverless operation with the goal of created, creating shared cars that can operate autonomously within designated areas of a city. Now, keep in mind, everybody, in the next decade, that's only three years away since we're in 2017. Right. Yeah. Man, uh, I love the future. I love the. F- I gotta I, say, Nick, you really called it with like a lot of the autonomy and vehicles coming up this year. It's it's pretty insane how that keeps coming in the news and it's just moving forward every time. Yeah, it seems like every week it just compounds on itself and and is here to say, hey, we're a thing. We're going to be, you know, in your face soon. I, yeah, this is, and okay, so the big the big thing behind this story, right, is the fact that uh, Daimler and Bosch the. Like these, this is the guy behind Mercedes. These are the guys behind Mercedes. They're the big automotive names, right? Big manufacturers. Oh yeah, big time players in the game. Right. They are saying that we are gonna have this in three years, and I mean they they kind of backtracked on that in the article. They were like, "Well, yeah, I mean, we could see it by the end of next decade, but still, the fact that they're pushing for this is just amazing. It's gonna it's gonna drive competition." to make other people or, or other companies, I should say, uh, want to get ahead of the game as well. Yeah. And in the article actually mentions that Daimler themselves have partnered with Uber on some of the software side of, and that'll both help, like, I guess other, uh, ride hailing apps to kind of boost their sales as well for getting automated stuff going. But I mean, I can't believe that they're going to boost for both level four and five within such a short amount of time. I mean, it does seem a little unfeasible, but still really exciting. I don't think it's totally unfeasible. I think because they're look, look closely at what they're saying here. They're saying autonomous vehicles to urban roads uh, in very specific areas. Right. So I don't think it it depends on what their, uh, what their definition of specific areas is, but I don't think it's all that far off. I think I think it's totally doable. But since we're talking about automated vehicles, what's up next? All right. Oh, sorry, guys. So over the next three weeks, roughly 100 people will climb aboard Harry, a self-driving shuttle that will take them around a two-mile course in London's North Greenwich. The UK wants to demonstrate how technology could be used to for the last mile trips in urban areas. The purpose of the trials is to see how pub- how the public reacts to self-driving vehicles and to examine how the technology can be best applied in built-up areas. Now, Nick, I'm not completely sure what last mile trips are, but I'm stoked that they're employing this technology to see how people adapt to it. So as far as I understand, last mile trips are like uh, those, those distances that are close but not quite within reach. Like, let's say you have a destination... Uh, you, you go to a new city after um, you, you go to a new city, you land in the airport and then you have to take public transportation or um, a taxi or something to get to your hotel. This is that last mile. You've traveled all this distance and that last mile to get you from the airport to your hotel. That's as far as I understand. Um, that's pretty perfect. I mean, that's a that's an awesome little short lived trip. But I mean, I think it's a great proof of concept for these little pod oh, yeah. cars. And super important too. I mean, think about how many times you've gone on a trip and like had to find some, either call a cab or like look up um, some way to utilize public transportation to get from point A to point B. How awesome would it be uh, if like Uber or Lyft, you just dial it up on your phone and say, I'm here, come pick me up. And then you hop in this pod and it takes you to your hotel. It'd be pretty awesome. And I mean, it, this would be super cost effective, too, if they're allowing because it's about like four people per pod. So, I mean, it's it's now like a, a ride sharing thing at its maximum capacity. That's really cool. Right. Yeah. I. Uh, so this is um, this is also being used in urban areas, which is, I think, the key here. Right. Like if you use it in rural areas, then what are you really proving? But the fact that they're going to be able to sort of interoperate with the other vehicles in the area and the fact that they're actually using trials now. So, like, this is, it's built. The shelf, the self driving shuttle is built. Now they're putting people into it and testing it. Yeah, I know. And I, I like the 
because I mean, it's a repurposed shuttle, I guess what they call the ultra pod that already existed at London Heathrow airport anyway. And for them to just be putting this out there to see how people adapt to it is my favorite part. Cause I mean, the, the concepts there, this thing doesn't really have a high maximum speed. It's re- it's really not dangerous, but they want to see how, how, likely are people to actually use it what are their feelings of it and that kind of stuff right yeah they're they're talking about getting um getting the public on board with it and and so this is each trip i think is going to provide them with a ton of data right like um so they'll get like i i think the article says four terabytes of data every eight hours that's insane which i don't even see how you can comb through that much data it within like eight hours alone it's insane. right no it's a it's an insane amount of data and hopefully they'll be able to glean something from it um but dude we got a ton of news let's go ahead and move on to the next one yeah for sure so here we go so soon ways will Waze's data will not only help drivers avoid accidents, but help emergency responders identify them as they happen the google owned navigation service has partnered with the European Emergency Number Association to anonymously share data that will help police, ambulance, and fire services detect and respond to incidents in real time, potentially saving lives in the process. Now, Nick, I thought this was a great way, I don't know, because we've gone through a lot of stories where it's scary how much data is being shared, but I feel like this is the best way something like Waze's data could be used, because, I mean, it's it's great that they show you, like, on your own little GPS unit that, oh, there's, like, an accident coming up, but it, having that data communicated to actually people who can do something about it or actually provide emergency services is right. awesome. Well, I okay, so this, a couple things. Let me back up and say, wow, a lot of these things are happening happening across the pond and uh, the majority of our listeners are in uh, the United States, but we do have listeners abroad. And if any of you uh, listeners from across the pond are listening to any of these stories and happen to see any of these affect you firsthand, please write in. We want to hear about it. We want to know what you think. Uh, Second off. So we talked about um, the, the data, right? So I, Yes, it's interesting, and it's really great that it's going to be used in this way, but it's going to be uh, – there, there, there's going to have to be some trial and error when it comes to setting thresholds, right? So what do you do? Do you do you send it to them when one crash report pops up because it could have been an accident that you know, somebody actually pressed the wrong button on Waze? And that, so how do you verify it, right? Do you do you do it when two people verify that a crash is there? Is it too late then at that point? So it opens up a whole bunch of issues. I'm already splitting hairs, but yes, no, this is great because that data will be there to help the emergency services. But then I, I, I can't help but criticize where are the thresholds? What are your thoughts on that, Blake? Honestly, I mean, I, f- I feel similar to what you do i it's not really detailed in the article very well how they're going to make any decisions about that but they do talk specifically about that it's more for also helping people figure out traffic patterns so if they're going to have to reroute a bunch of people because there's a lot of traffic caused by like an accident that's where they would use a lot of it i don't know how they would deal with actual accidents because you're right it is it's easy for a user to accidentally click something or not be paying attention and not fix an issue or anything like that. Now I know that using Waze, they do like, it, it's pretty updatable and pre- people are pretty good about using it. Right. Um, but yeah. I, I don't really know. It's, it's a strange one. It's a cool way ahead, but like you said, the threat, some of the thresholds and then the reliability of the data and then who's going to comb through it. That's a little bit, uh, to be determined. So I'd imagine they'd have like, uh, computers, monitoring this and and basically if if a thing is reported and it's verified by like three users then or, or two users or whatever those th- i think the thresholds might have to be dependent on how much traffic is in that area right because if you're if you're in a very rural area and one person reports it that's probably enough to go okay we should probably check that out but then you know if, if you're in a very populated area one might not be enough right it might be an accident it might be uh an error and so You'd have to get like two or three people to verify it before you send out emergencies, or I don't know, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's a lot even, to think about. And you might have to worry about times of day, depending on like how much traffic is potentially going to oh, be yeah. in an area on a given day. Oh yeah, or yeah, like less people driving at night. Do you do you need one person? Like they're bored anyway, right? Send them out, spend our tax money. Uh, well, this is in uh, this is across the pond. Anyway, all right, what's up next? 
All right. So my favorite company in their robotics, Disney has sent in a new patent application for a robot that will move and physically interact like an animated character that has been adapted for soft contact and or interaction with a human. The robot has soft skin and body parts with some of the body filled with air or gas, and it's operated by a controller that changes the interaction to keep children safe. The patent doesn't name specific characters, but they did confirm they made a toy size prototype based on a Disney character. And the sketch included with the application shows a round plush body. Now, Nick, this is super interesting to me that it, one, I mean, it's, it's a Disney thing. So, you know, there's a lot of potential use for it for them. There's money but behind it too. Oh yeah. There's a bunch of money in it, but the way that they talk about it, that it's, adapted for soft contact and to interact with people. I feel like there's a lot of applications for this outside of like the Disney world. Oh yeah. So yes, yes. One, let me, let me first comment on who I think this prototype is. Have you seen big hero six? Oh, I have indeed. I think it's Baymax. It's gotta be Baymax, right? I think so too. I mean, I hope it is. That's, that'd be a really cool, like proof of concept. one. Oh yeah. I mean, they're building robots. Might as well. Um, but yes, no, this is great uh, because, one, we're going to replace character actors uh, with um, robots. And then so this is definitely one for our human robot interaction friends. Uh, but the, um, yeah, the applications beyond Disney, I can totally see this as being like, um, so, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to gauge how obscure I could get right now with my nerdiness, but I'll refrain. <laughs> I, no, I, I will. I will refrain. Um, but like, I'm thinking about applications where you could assign therapy robots where, um, you know, instead of like a, a dog or a cat that or a companion that you have to take care of, what if somebody is physically incapable of taking care of a dog or a cat and you give them a robot that's nice to hold and can hang out with you and, you know, potentially could help with depression or anxiety or anything like I, I love this. Yeah, and I mean on the on the idea of somebody maybe that's ridden at home or can't take care of themselves. I mean, this could help supplement having like twenty four hour nurse care, right? Um, I'm I thinking, mean, that's that's a little more complex, but I mean, it's it's a really cool notion. I I hope because the article does talk about how often companies will just file for patents and not really have anything behind it until maybe technology drives it or keep it out of the hands of other people. Right. So I hope that we continue to see movement in this fashion. Well, yeah, I'm just when I said robots in the household, I, I just meant like, uh, you know, something that you can hold that will react to your touch uh, because being alone in a house where you can't really do anything can be crippling. It can be absolutely crippling. And to, just to have something there that maybe isn't real, but it can seem that way. I don't know. I don't know. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's move on to, I need, I need a, I need a robot to hug right now. All right, let's, let's move on to, <laughs> to the we'll next just one. Walk over this... to Alexa and give her a hug. It'll be fine. Hang on, hang on. Let me ask oh. her, Alexa, can I have a hug? I'd be happy to. Alas, I don't have arms. Ah, damn. All right. Oh, she says she's still here for me. All right. What's up next? All right. On that note. So Buffy Lee, an 11th grader at Santa Cruz's Kirby prep school, spent most of her spring break coordinating the launch of her new app, TagDat. Lee created TagDat with co-founders Wilson Lee, no relation, and, and University of California student Zing Kai. TagDat is a bright and playful tagging app that lets users rate a place with a with at a glance descriptors like spicy or authentic, rather than digging through a bunch of non very searchable words. So Nick, I, taking a look at this, I f- can't even believe this was done by an eleventh grader with help of like two people to have a little more experience in the startup world. But this is pretty sweet. Yeah, uh, I. Uh, human factors cast 100% more spicy. Now 100% more spicy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that. I'm going to keep that as the title. But I think this is uh, uh, I'm this is this is one of those stories, man. Where I'm just like, <laughs> He's just what? Torn up over this one. No, I. This is one of those stories where I'm like, what am I doing with my life? How come I haven't created something like this? And then I look back and I'm like, oh yeah, we created a podcast. All right, sure, fine, whatever. But this is an app that. Uh, this is cool, man. 
I'm jealous. Yeah. And they raised like what at first round, like almost three hundred thousand dollars, and now they're looking for second round four hundred four million dollars or something for expansion. So yeah, I I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, I uh, I'm really happy that. So on a few fronts, okay. So I'm happy that both females and young people are getting into coding. This is a tremendous step forward. Like, I'm I'm so happy. I'm so happy for this. Um, And then on the other hand, I'm also very happy about this app as well because, I mean, honestly, how many times have you used Yelp and you're like, oh, my God, I got to sort through all this crap to find out exactly what I want? Like, do they have do they have a good this? Like, like if I'm looking for a California burrito, I want to know, you know, if their California burrito is good and I can look for descriptors like good and tasty and uh. The ingredients, even you can be like avocado, um, or guacamole and cheese and meat. You know, like these are the things that I want to know. I don't care to read emojis here and then attaching like really simple words to them versus like because I've gotten frustrated with Yelp just returning bad results basically or or not being able to find information based on the way that it was tagged. And right. I mean, these these emojis are like really. It looks like most of them are related to food and like. I don't know. This is going to make like at a glance, you can see like, okay, this place is rated based off of um, tag that these, th- these are the things that I'm looking for. Um, right. Yeah, you know, the get- only challenge they have of course is getting a big, bigger user base. Right. So that they have data across lots and lots of establishments. Right. Yeah. Well, I'd imagine, you know, they could very easily like rip from Yelp's API, although I don't know the legality of that. Probably not okay. But uh, but yeah, can we put like uh, podcasts on there and just rate Human Factors Cast spicy? Or please, uh, yeah. You know what? If if uh, all of our listeners would go to our iTunes page or our Facebook page and just write spicy, that'd be enough, I think. That would be perfect. Oh my I, gosh! I don't think anything would make my day more. Oh my! <laughs> Just it seeing would, a bunch of reviews. It would. Like spicy. Spicy. Oh, these guys are spicy. All right, all right. I think that's a good time to move on to the next one. <laughs> all right. So Google expanded on their material design guidelines with the launch of a new color tool meant to help developers and designers pick the right color palettes for their apps. The new tool helps developers create and share color palettes, but it also comes with the ability to then apply that color scheme to a sample user interface and to various material design components in CodePen, a third-party playground for front-end web developers. Now, Nick, this is a really good idea. Like that, because I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about you. I like to do front-end code, but I'm not the best with picking like a full color scheme. So this looked really helpful to me. So this is a, this is great for a variety of reasons. Uh, The first and foremost comes to my mind. I'm a developer um, and developers don't always have either the funds or the resources to hire designers or um, anyone who can make in-house components. And so this might help them or provide them with kind of like a template to say, here you go. These are approved. These will um, these will look good with what you're trying to do, and that to them would make their product better without even having to hire a designer. Now, of course, it'd be better to hire some human factors person and get in there and really organize those things in a way that makes sense. But uh, for that consistent look and feel across all of Google's products, I feel like this is a, a good compromise. Oh, most definitely. I think it. I think material design itself has provided a pretty good baseline for how things should interact and the best way to use some of the components that they provide and the documentation is just um, really, it's, I don't know, it's really useful. It's it's, Uh, So adding tools like this is just going to make it a lot more fun to use. I agree. I agree. Uh, There's another interesting thing about this tool is that, uh, did you see this, that it automatically evaluates the legibility? Um, So of, of basically like the text in your, like if you're using Comic Sans, it'll say no, no, don't do that, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, it it references this with um, accessibility guidelines, and uh, we'll like look at things like contrast and font, and um, you know it'll it'll also take into consideration like uh, people with vision impairments, so like red green red green colorblind. Um, so uh, that's another interesting thing about this thing that wasn't mentioned in the little blurb. 
Yeah, and that's like a great step on Google's part and the developers behind them because, I mean, uh, like text legibility can be difficult when you're playing around with colors and to have it take that into account for you while you're building your UI or trying to use it on your UI, it makes it great for, for you, like for just normal users because I, I don't know if you've had the experience of having to read something that's just horribly contrasted, like it just oh, yeah. drives me nuts to even try. So it, it's good feature. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Try reading orange on red. <laughs> Oh, I'd Orange rather Dex cry. Android. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I just want to take a quick minute, though, to thank our friends at Gizmodo, Engadget, Wired, TechCrunch, Eurogamer, and CNN for bringing us the stories this week. Uh, we post all the articles that we talk about on the show on our Facebook and Twitter, so you can go there to follow all the links uh, to all of the original articles that are posted on these fine websites and establishments and uh, places. All right, <laughs> Blake, what's up next? <laughs> All right, so last week, Digital Foundry revealed the specs for the next Xbox, codename Project Scorpio. When comparing Scorpio to the current Xbox One, the CPU is about 30% faster, the GPU is 4.6 times more powerful, and it can render video at 60 frames per second in 4K ultra resolutions. Now, Nick, I know you're much more of a PS4 fan, but I am super excited to see how this all turns out. Yeah, so you are the Xbox guy of the podcast. I got you uh, to buy a PlayStation, and I haven't seen you on ever since because you're over there on Xbox playing Gears of War. Uh, what does this mean for you, man? Like, this is... Well, okay, so th- I've read this article a few times, and I'm not sure what this means to be can be for me to be completely honest, Nick, because I'm, they, they're like, they're talking a lot about how it's going to be really good for 4k and they're doing all these developments for that. Now I don't, I don't really have a 4k system and Xbox one for me. I mean, I haven't had it for that long. Um, so really I want to see what happens when they drop it, what titles start coming out. That's much more of a big hit for me, um, over, cause I mean, obviously the computing power of the thing is amazing. Um, so, but it, it's, it's one of those things where I want to see a little bit more about what's going to happen, uh, once it drops. See, so I don't know if they're going to actually release new games specifically for the Scorpio. I feel like now we're in this, uh, sort of rhythm where we'll, we're almost in that same rhythm where with the phones, you know how there's a new phone, there's a new Android every year. There's a new Samsung every year. There's a new iPhone every year. It's the same operating system, and sometimes they'll get upgrades. But for the most part, all your apps that worked on your other phone will work on a phone in the future. And, you know, there are some that are way far uh, gone that they don't work on anything anymore. But I feel like we're almost moving to that model with games now. I feel like this will play everything that the Xbox One plays. But going forward, if you buy... If you buy this Project Scorpio, if you buy this, uh, games will look phenomenal on it. And, you know, they'll just down-res it for the regular Xbox One. And so everybody can play it. It just will look better on the um, the higher-end stuff. And and you see PlayStation doing this, too. They just released the Pro a couple um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, months? Months. A couple months ago. But the uh, the main downside to that one was that the Pro doesn't do this 4K UHD uh, 60 frames a second. Like, it's one or the other. You can do either do 60 frames a second or you can do 4K UHD. So Yeah, exactly, right? I don't know. This thing is pretty powerful. Uh, I'll be honest, too. Like, teraflops, I have no idea what that means. Uh, <laughs> I could not figure out, like, are they, like, making jokes or what does this really mean for the future no, ter- in gaming terms? No, teraflops is a real thing. No, hang on. Um Terra, okay, so this is gonna. <laughs> I know some of our listeners are go, like face palming right now because it's probably something really easy to understand. But a unit of computing speed equal to one million million floating point operations per second. Okay, now what's a floating point operation? Uh, that does that make <laughs> any sense to you? Yes. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Specific specific to floating point numbers, a floating point operation is any mathematical operation such as plus, minus, uh, multiply, divide, or assignment that involves a floating point numbers such as opposed to binary integer operations. Uh, all right, I'm getting down a rabbit hole. This is I. If any of our listeners can explain to me what a teraflop is, please write it. I want to know. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, I'd love to hear an explanation from somebody who actually knows what it's about. That'd be awesome. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next story. Blake, what's up? 
All yes. right. So have you ever had to share the middle seat on an airplane with a stranger? That's the worst. Malone, <laughs> you're telling me, Malone Lobb Designs wants to introduce the world to a stagger seat concept that sits slightly below and behind its neighbors so it can be three inches wider than its window and aisle adjacent companions complete with its own armrest. Now, Nick, if they do this, whatever airline implements it first, I'm only ever flying on that airline. Except United, no. Did you see that stuff today? <laughs> no, 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 I didn't. Oh, my gosh. Uh, politics aside, United like tore this guy off the plane, basically, because um, of their policies. And I don't want to like hijack this this article to talk about it, but... They basically. Oh man, yeah. United's been having some serious problems with some of the yeah. stuff that they're. <laughs> they're oh my gosh! Yeah. Saying over their rules. Uh huh. Yeah. So uh, you know what? If this designs on United, mm, oh god, it's going to be really hard to resist. But all right, let's talk about this design. So this design. Um. So this is basically it's it's uh it's hard to describe, but it's like a recessed seat, um, that sits about an inch or two behind the other two seats in the row, right? So you have the window seat and the aisle seat, and then the middle seat is about two inches back. And the way they've designed the armrest is that the people in the aisle and the window seat can rest their arms, and since their arms are forward uh, and the seat is back in the middle, the person in the middle can rest their arms on, like, kind of like the their elbows on where the other two seats are, but it's kind of, like, caved in. Right, I feel like I'm not describing this well enough. No, I think you're. I think you're hitting it pretty right. I mean, it's exactly what you said. The middle seat is just a little farther back than the other two. What I really like, to be honest, because although it's hard for me to do, I love sleeping on planes. Is it the headrest? And so they, the headrest is yeah, awesome so they, too. Like, yeah, they've brought the headrest out on one side, so it gives you that little bit of extra cushion, so you don't like end up in your <laughs> neighbor's oh, yeah. lap or on their shoulder. And it means that everybody's resting their head in the same way, so like you're not gonna rest up against somebody who like if the two people on the sides both rest on the middle like you're screwed right but now now everybody could get gets a side everybody gets a headrest yeah the the only thing i do question is like when now looking at it the the arborist situation seems a little small for the person that's recessed back a little bit but i mean you can't really get everything in these small planes anyway well, I, okay, so I think it's less about the armrest and more about the elbow room because think about it. Like when you're in the middle, you're like, oh, you, your body language is just completely collapsed because there's two people, two strangers presumably on either side of you. And so I think this just gives you a little bit more room to be like, okay, I'm not going to hit them there. And that's got to be com- that's got to be more comfortable than not. Now, um, one thing that I'm really interesting it, or it, – it's Monday. One thing that I'm really interesting in. Um, <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> this podcast, that's the one that you're really interested in. That's it. That's it. That's it. Uh, <laughs> there's a, they, they talk about this, um, this ability to like fold them, right? That am I, I'm not imagining that, right? Or is that another? No, no, part? you're right. Okay. You're right. Okay. Now, are they saying that like you fold them and then it allows for more e- e- easier, Wow. Okay. I can't talk. Easier boarding, right? So I'm just scanning really quick. I, I know I read this in here. Yeah. I mean, it, it shows how they'll fold back a little ah. farther so it would be much more flush in the seat. Um, but it, in, all, in all honesty, Nick, I don't know that that's any different oh. from really what's available now. No, 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 no. I think I understand now. I don't think I understood, but now I think I understand. So I think what they do, okay. So you're looking at this picture, right, of the um, – I'm looking at the one kind of like top down of the three seats, and the headrest is on the right. And to all our listeners, you can follow along uh, by going to our Facebook and looking for this article. Um, it's a one by Wired. They Okay, so I'm looking at this picture, right? So now, Blake, stick with me for a sec. Imagine if that middle seat was not attached to those armrests, and mm-hmm. you could slide that over to the left – and it goes basically underneath the left seat. Oh. Okay. Ooh. You're following along, right? So Yeah. So that now opens up. Now instead of one aisle for four for six seats, you have three aisles for four seats each row. So 
now you can board the people who are, you know, um, on, uh, on either the window seat or the aisle seat first or, or something, you know, like boarding the window seats, everybody comes in and then boarding the aisle seats, everybody comes in and finds their place. And then the middle seats have to climb over people, but it doesn't even matter at that point because they're just right there. Uh, and so it might speed up, uh, on boarding, no pun intended because it's a human factor <laughs> show. Yeah. I mean, now I see what you're saying. Yeah. The, so the slipping out of the seat. Yeah. That would make things a lot faster if you had that many, uh, many aisles to go down. And if you tiered the seating that way. Oh yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. That'd be okay. I feel like we spent an adequate amount of time on this. Let's move on to the next one. It was just a beautiful seat. All right, so this is one I'm sure our listeners will love. Since they're listening to a science podcast, this one is for all you science lovers out there. So a friend of the show, Chris Hardwick, will be coming to NBC this fall in The Awesome Show. The Awesome Show is a new NBC series that will explore and highlight the latest advances in science and technology. No premiere date has been, premiere date has been set, but it's only something to keep an eye out for. Now, that's cool because we just talked, I think, a couple weeks ago about Bill Nye's Netflix series that's kind of similar. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really great that... So it kind of seems like, at least in America and um, maybe elsewhere, I don't know. It, it just seems like in America, though, that science has been getting a back seat and the fact that now it's coming to primetime television on NBC... Uh, I feel like this will have a huge impact for the way uh, Americans view science, and I, I really hope, I really hope this has an effect. <laughs> I hope so too, because I mean, Chris Hardwick's got a pretty good, per- pretty great personality, and a lot of people like him, so he'll bring his own set of listeners to the show and all that kind of stuff. And it being on NBC will, especially in like a prime time spot, like it's claiming, I don't know, they must have a lot of faith and faith in it behind it, or it's testing well. Yeah, well, I mean, they they don't have any date set yet, right? So who knows what what kind of thing? And I I'm interesting. I, I, oh my god, there I go again. I'm interesting. Uh, I'm interested in what topics they're going to bring to the table, though. Like, are they going to focus on just hard science? Are they going to focus on social science as well? It'd be really interesting to see. And and maybe who knows? Maybe uh, they will invite Human Factors Cast to come on as a panel and uh, talk about some of the news stories. Yeah, let's just call Chris and see what's up. Yeah, we'll call Chris Hardwick. I, I mentioned he's a friend of the show. I met him once. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Friend of the interesting Nick Rome. Yeah, I'm interesting. I almost want to put that as the uh, title, but I'll keep now 100% more spicy. <laughs> all right, what's up next? Oh, man. Okay. So <laughs> this is what I'm sure, all, sure our listeners will love. It can be hard to find a full copy of an article you need on short notice. Unpaywall is a browser plugin that identifies the paper you're looking for, then checks whether it's available for free anywhere on the web. Where was this when I was doing my thesis? Right. Install the, <laughs> install the plugin in Firefox or Chrome, and when you arrive at a page summarizing or showing part of an I- article, a little lock icon appears telling you whether you can get it somewhere else for free. Now, the for free part, and it's searching for you, is amazing. Yes. Uh, So I know we have a lot of graduate students and uh, professionals that listen to the show. And uh, I figure, what the hell? Let's let them know about this uh, because this showed up in my newsfeed. And I feel like this is uh, (laughs) it's important for science, first of all. But I I, I wonder I haven't had a chance to check this out. Have you had a chance to check this out at all, Blake? No, but I definitely will be because I mean, a lot of the stuff I'm interested in, even though I'm interested in definitely human factor science i love reading some of the uh, more science journals geared towards fitness and nutrition so i'm right. hoping maybe this will help me out so one thing i'm i'm still unclear on and maybe this is a future capability but they um they are so so i'm a graduate student and i put in my username and password for my graduate student library wherever i go to school and d- do does unpaywall then look across everything taking into account all my stuff is it like one of those uh portals that the graduates uh not just graduate schools does is it like one of those portals that schools have at their library where it's like search all of our databases to see if this is available for you somewhere or um is it just open source science that's a really good point and i don't know maybe 
maybe we should write them in and say something about that because I mean, if they're not going to do that, that's a great thing to try and implement. Right. Cause when I remember being in school, you get access to some of the bigger journals and some of the like bigger publication centers like Sage just for, for right. being in school or being a part of a specific organization. So I don't know. I don't know if it actually takes into that, that into account. I would assume that it might, um, just because I mean, if it's looking for anything free on the web, um, it might be trying to take into account a little more information or give you a wider scope if it knows more about you or stuff you have access to. Hang on. You know what? I'm going to pull an Elon Musk right now and I'm going to open source an idea that I fully thought out of. And I didn't just think of this right now while we were talking about this. So if you find any holes in this, I've, I've thought about them. Really? This. Uh, so here's the idea. Here's the idea. You could be snaky with your um, end user license agreement and say, we're going to take your username and password and allow students from other schools and institutions to log in using it, but they'll never see it. They'll, they'll just use it to get papers. But because we're using your data, you can also use other people's data, right? So Blake, you're a student at X school, and I'm a student at Y school, and we have a friend at Z school. And we all sign up for this program, and we put in all our usernames and passwords. And then when we go to look for an article, we then search across all of our resources. What do you think? Man, that would be that would be super hype because what if one of your buddies is somebody that, I don't know, went to school abroad. So now you have a, oh, yeah. an even wider net you can cast or like d access to different types of research on both sides. I, I don't know. That sounds like a great idea to me. Now, of course it's a little, it's a little loosey goosey with how other people would potentially come after you for it. Like some of the publication companies, but well, I mean, it I almost know. sounds like piracy, but I mean, if you're just sharing, I don't know. Yeah, uh, don't the know. Part, the only thing I I don't know. I have, the only thing about totally that is like it, it is a little bit of piracy, but it's for education. And it's for science. science out there. That's for science. I, yeah, it's for science. Like, well, I mean, I, like, I don't know. Okay, okay. So what's the? Maybe maybe we have lawyers listening to the show. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe or or maybe somebody who studied law and is now into human factors. I don't know. But if you know anybody, like what is the difference between that and Windows saying, "Okay, your Wi-Fi username and password, we're going to share this to all your Facebook friends so that way when you come over, like it they can just sign in and it's fine." Cuz they did do that. It's like that's what I'm saying. Like there's there's got to be some something somebody will shut this down, but I don't know. Write us in. I want to know. All right, what's up next? Seriously. Oh, this one, this one's really cool and near and dear. So the U.S. Food and Drug Administration today allowed marketing of 23andMe personal genome service genetic health risk, or GHR, tests for 10 diseases or conditions, including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. These are the first direct-to-consumer test authorized by the FDA that provide information on individuals ge genetic predisposition to certain medical diseases or conditions which may help to make decisions about lifestyle choices or to inform decisions with a healthcare professional now Nick I don't know about you but I've been into these kind of uh, genetic testing ideas for a long time and I, I haven't done one because they are quite expensive and I remember there was a lot on the market at one point and I I did a lot of research into 23andMe, but this may be the one that I try. This is it. This is it. Yeah, no, this is uh, great for the future, for sure. Because if we have the ability to predict this, why wouldn't we uh, want that data? And if you can, the earlier you can cache something, the better, right? So this is just all around great. There's, like I said in the intro, there's a ton of great science news, and this is one of them. Oh, yeah, and especially now because we're at a great time where there's all this access to the sequencing of the genome that's been done, and there's companies like this, but also, too, there's a lot of metabolic therapies that are being developed to try and treat some of these diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And like you just said, the earlier you catch them, the better chance you have at maybe combating them with either lifestyle or diet choices. Right, yeah, no, for sure. Great news. I don't really have anything to say other than great news, and this is fantastic, and Excellent. Uh, let's get on to another happy story. All righty. So 
Patricia Lauder, a 73-year-old retiree from Harwinton, knew that something was seriously wrong in mid-January after her wearable fitness tracker displayed a resting heart rate of 140 beats per minute. She dialed 911 and was taken to the emergency department at the local hospital. During the ride, first responders confirmed that the device on her wrist had been t- what the device on her wrist had been telling her. They measured a heart rate above 140 beats per minute while she was lying down. Wow, that's really intense. So doctors performed a series of tests and found that she had blood clots in both of her lungs. The doctors noted that the that noted in this situation the use of a fitness tracker could have been life-saving. Now, that's something I did not expect from just a simple fitness tracker. Yeah, well, uh I so here's the thing. I I believe it because when uh I when I had my appendectomy, uh, my heart rate was running high and I was really sweaty and there were things that my fitness tracker was telling me. But I'm just an idiot, so I ignored it. <laughs> like the 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 standout piece of this story is that this woman was paying attention to her fitness tracker. I have a Fitbit. Do you have a Fitbit or any fitness tracker? I used to. I've broken three of them, so I don't have one at the moment. Do you do you like monitor it every single day? Um, literally what I was using it for was trying to determine calorie burn and changing my VO2 max while working out. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really monitor it for sleeping or worry about my heart rate too much outside of workouts, but I don't know if something was pinging me that my heart rate was really high at multiple times during the day. That might be something to pay attention to. See, the main reason why I have mine is for historical data, right? So like if I, if I would like to know what my heartbeat was or my heart rate was, you know, three months ago, I can be, Oh yeah. Well, I'm clearly doing good because my heart rate has gone down. Um, my weight has gone down. My steps have increased, you know, that kind of stuff. I can look at it at the historical level, but like she's day by day going, Oh, my heart rate's high. Like that's stuff that I wouldn't pay attention to. So uh, this is, this is great. If you pay attention to your fitness tracker. Yeah, and I mean, on that note, Nick, this something like this might be in future builds or updates to the software, taking into account, to, like, if you yeah, see something out you. normal, maybe letting people know. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I want to I wanna do a quick shout-out to Mia. Um, she was on the show a couple weeks ago, but she actually sent me this article and said, have you seen this? And I was like, no, that'd be great. Talk about it on the show. You want to be on? She's like, yeah. And then uh, she was busy tonight, so she couldn't be on. Oh, bummer, but that's awesome. I know. Thanks for sending that in, Mia. Yeah, and just like you guys can, to humanfactorscast at gmail.com or our Facebook or our Twitter or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I feel Please like I'm do. always I feel like I'm always like this on Mondays. I don't know. It's good. That's why we do this on Mondays, have a little bit of fun at the end of the long day. Oh yeah, we gotta. We gotta start off the week right and uh totally unprofessional and um just goofing around about human factors news. Loosey goosey. All right, what's up next? <laughs> All right. So keeping it in the medical realm. So following a head injury, patients undergo a CT scan to rule out blame, rule out brain bleeding. Thank goodness. A new head worn device that scans the brain's electrical patterns has shown tremendous promise in clinical trials, presenting an inexpensive way for physicians to make a potentially life saving diagnosis. The Ahead 300 was developed by BrainScope and consists of a headset that beams data into a handheld device. The Ahead can assess the likelihood that the patient has more than one millimeter of bleeding in the brain. Wow, that's really precise. So signaling the need for a more thorough evaluation by a medical personnel. BrainScope hasn't disclosed the cost of its system, but it says a head 300 will be a fraction of the cost of a CT scanner, which runs $90,000 to $2.5 million. $2.5 million. Wow, it's a big gap, depending on what features the CT scanner has. Now, Nick, this is awesome because I could just already see these things being used all over the place in any kind of sports that you have to oh, yeah. you experience a lot of like brain trauma or potential for it. Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, I'm just laughing at the a fraction of the cost. 99 out of 100 is a fraction. I'm just saying. But yeah, I, I do. That's very true. <laughs> I do feel like this will be a reduction in cost for sure. But uh, no, you're right. The uh, What is that called with um, when you get that? It's it's something. Why am I blinking on it? The, where, where you get into uh, concussions with uh, football or whatever. Is it CTE? Is um, what is it? Yeah, I, I maybe. What is it? It's like um, 
Ah, hang on, I gotta look it up now. Hang on, I'm gonna type. While I'm typing, type away. Blake, or Blake you can ask Alexa. Talk. You never know. Yeah. Oh, uh, Alexa, what is the uh, thing when football players get a concussion? Maybe. Who knows? She doesn't. <laughs> She's Sorry, thinking. She might I can't find the herself. answer to the question I heard. Yeah, she doesn't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, there's a, there's a thing that uh, that football players get after like getting concussions and knocked around that like. They don't. I'm not really articulating this all that well, but there, they there's like no early warning signs for it, and I'm thinking maybe this will help. I don't know. It's the uh, oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, this is cool. This is this will help. Uh, I, I the interesting part of this to me is that it's like a tricoder. If you're a uh, Star Trek fan, type of device, like it, it literally sk- it sends the things over to a device that you kind of scan over. Uh yeah I don't know it it's cool it's cool I don't really have a whole lot to say because I don't have a background in human factors in uh, the medical field but um I can see where this could be useful for sure well I think it's it's good because I mean the cost of CT scans is pretty expensive even if you have health insurance and I, I mean it's kind of nerve wracking to get in the machines and all that kind of stuff as well and oh now yeah this is basically just sticking sticking some head like some very simple looking headgear on you and then transmitting to a handheld device so there's potential that you don't have to involve so many high level professionals could be just a nurse coming in and getting you like prepared or seeing seeing if you need to see a medical professional or it could even be used on the fly like at games or stuff like that oh yeah no that that's that's a really good point Blake and that's uh that's why I have you on the show because I can't think of everything <laughs> but hey man I'm here for you <laughs> thanks buddy let's talk about something that I am well versed in yes this is Nick's field ladies and gentlemen so last week the augmented reality company ODG unveiled a model of its glasses optimized specifically for business customers who need a more advanced level of protective eyewear oh this is really cool so the r 7 HL, I don't know why I had our time with that, are designed for situations such as oral, oil exploration and production, energy, mining, utilities, chemical production, and pharmaceuticals. The R7HL will begin shipping by the end of the second quarter of 2017 and will sell for about $3,500. These glasses look really amazing, and I love the idea that it's being used for something so I don't like chemical production because I know that that's a big deal when it comes to trying to protect your eyes and your face as well. Right. Yeah. This is the uh, tough case of uh, augmented reality glasses. Tremendously valuable because I've worked in in the um, the energy field. I've worked in uh, so uh, I'm trying to see what's under my NDA. Uh, so when when um, electrical engineers go to substations, right? That's an environment, and uh, it can be. There's a lot of stuff in there, and there's a lot of stuff that can hurt you in there. And so to wear the protective stuff in that environment is uh, is very valuable. And so now, the fact okay, the thing that really gets me on this is that they're augmented reality glasses. Now, what does that mean? That means your hands are free, so they're not having to use a tablet or anything else to look at their environment. They are just evaluating the environment and sort of passively taking in all this information, and their hands can be free, and it will protect their eyes, and it will protect them from all the heavy stuff that will hurt their eyes. Yes. Man, I thought I was going to end strong, but that was just weak. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's all right man it's been a it's been a long monday i'm sure and but dude, i mean the one thing i am interested in is like you just said i mean this is we've seen a lot of augmented reality stories in the past couple of weeks like you having to use tablets or even having to have special hardware to even use them in in like shops and things like that but this is all like in some glasses that are protective that are made for harsh environments like working in the chemical production industry or with pharmaceuticals or even an oil exploration. Um, so I, I don't know. I'd be really interested to have a better idea of how like these are tailored in, in terms of augmented reality for each business. 
Right. The thing that uh, is really interesting to me is that they're kind of layered. And so I wonder if, depending on what your domain is, you might use different layers. Um, so, like, if you need, like, a like airtight goggles, you know, for, for chemicals or something, you might use a different uh, accessory with it versus, um, you know, if you just need augmented reality and just something to protect you from, like, heavy things that could hit your face. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hope that is what's going on. This is kind of like a modular design that they have here with like all the glasses spread out across the entire picture. But yeah, it'll be definitely, awesome article, man. Definitely interesting to see uh, which companies adopt this and uh, incorporate it into training with their uh, employees. You got anything else on that one? I don't, man. I think you you hit it pretty hard. I'm, it's I hope to see more from this particular company. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope to see more from a bunch of companies. And uh, that's going to be it for today, everyone. Wow. I am. Ah, wow. I've just lost all my energy. If you <laughs> He's not spicy anymore. No, 100% more spicy. That's it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for games, topics, news stories you want us to cover, you can follow us on all our social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast Facebook page. Comment on our SoundCloud. Reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. Send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com or if you're really spicy, you can also leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing and want to help us out financially, we bring these things to you ad-free because we love you. You can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. If you really like what we're doing and don't want to support us financially but still want to support us, you can go over and subscribe and review us on iTunes, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. That helps us out, too. I want to thank Blake Arnstor for being on the show today. Blake, where can our listeners find you? Oh, thank you for having me, Nick. As always, you guys can find me on Don't Panic UX. You guys should tweet me with the hashtag 100% more spicy. 100% more spicy. And remember, just leave that on all of our social media. Just, Just... Tweet us spicy, hashtag human factors cast spicy, hashtag now 100% more spicy, hashtag Nick and Blake are spicy, hashtag (laughs) human factors spicy cast. I don't know. I'm losing it. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. If you had me on LinkedIn, uh, please say you're not a weirdo and, uh, or, or, or the, if you're a recruiter, don't add me on LinkedIn. That's 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 snaky. Don't do that. Just add me and say I'm a listener of the show. I love what you do. <laughs> this is the longest intro. Longest outro. Whatever. Thanks for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, what happens? It, it depends. depends on it how de- spicy you like it. It depends on spiciness or something. I don't know. It's spicy.